<laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, people. Welcome to Code It Live. Clearly, somebody is uh, sweating in their costume. I, I'm not only Santa, I've got some gifts for boys and girls. Jeff, you've been a good boy this year, right? Okay. Thank you. You've heard of Elf on a Shelf, right? I have. I got you a mensch on a bench. <sighs> Wonderful. <laughs> Sam, Sam, you. Not I'm on the naughty list. I'm forever on the naughty list. I've gotten forever. you this rock. I love you, <laughs> written in stone. I was oh, going to get coal, but there's been so many naughty <laughs> people this year, they've taken all my coal. I have solar panels. I don't care about your coal, Sam. <laughs> This is us. Uh, this is the How to Human show. Your hosts are Sam, Jeff, and Nicole. With us, we have our very, very dear friend, Arthur, or Art, as we call him. How are you doing, sir? Doing okay. How about you, Sam? Good, good. You know, um, we all have stuff. I, I saw um, uh, your uh, post about your cat being sick, and, and Jeff is sick, and <laughs> yeah, we all have stuff to deal with. Oh, I mean, that's life, right? Yeah, that's life. That's life. Uh, some of our friends are uh, joining in, um, uh, looks like. Hey, Bruce. Bruce Hi, hey. All right. So this is the How to Human show uh, because it's a struggle to be, you know, to be human at times. So we brought on Art uh, first because we wanted to talk about for the next hour, what is Mount Kitty behind um, this backer up. <laughs> Uh, but uh, Arthur is an expert, um, you know, about all Nothing. things mental health. Uh, yeah. So, um, Art, do you want to start us off? I, I see you have shared your um, your screen with us. Shall we bring yeah. that up? Sure. Um, I got to say first, I am an expert, but I'm an expert in a lived experience sense. I am not a psychologist. I am not a therapist. Um, and that's important because it means that I'm not, especially not your therapist, uh, to crib off of the lawyer line. Um, I'm not here to tell you medical advice and I'm not here to tell you anything about what you should or shouldn't be doing as far as medications or, um, your particular treatments, et cetera. And I mean, one legal concerns, but two, it's important because I'm not here to make judgments as well about what you're doing for treatment. So. Um, so before you start, Art, yeah. can we just do a quick plug? I absolutely love your content. And for folks who don't know, all of this stuff, it's hand-drawn by Art, live on Twitch streams. And yeah. uh, but what's your you know, Twitch handle, Art? It's Arthur Dollar. Uh, it's Arthur, like, Arthur Dollar. So. Arthur Dollar. There you go, folks. So if you like what you're seeing here on screen, which there's going to be uh, plenty more, uh, you know, tune into what Art does live when he's building his, you know, presentations uh, on Twitch. Thank you. I think I've seen this slide before of yours, and I've never actually read the caption before, and now it makes me smile. I like that. <laughs> I, the captions are nice. I put them in there because I needed space for citations, but then I just leave them in there because I, I realized at one point, I'm like, I have a whole bunch of space I could be filling with dumb jokes. So why not? Um, but yeah, I mean, to, to do reintroductions, uh, hi, my name is Art, and I'm a crazy person. And I use that phrase very specifically because it tells us things about the lack of good language that we really have to talk about what's happening inside of our heads and inside of other heads. And then on top of that, we, we think we're separate from our emotions. And we think that we're in total control of our own thoughts. And I'm here to tell you that we're really not. That we're in a system with our brains. And that they're part of us. They're part of this entire, you know, meat suit that we're wearing. And we can't get away from that, that these things are interrelated and that largely we can't control what happens to us. I mean, I've, this, this slide has really hit home a lot since the pandemic started where it's just like, you know, we had a couple of years still are having, right? Cause the pandemic is still ongoing, a whole bunch of things that just drove home how little we can control in our own lives. And those things affect us. 
right? I don't think that's a stretch to say that when things like a global pandemic happen and we're suddenly not able to, you know, go to work and we see our friends and everybody's reduced to tiny panels on Zoom, that that's not going to affect us somehow. And in general, we also can't control our own thoughts. Our brain is, it does what it does in a lot of cases. And that it we're so bad at it that we actually, I, I dug this paper out from 2019. Um, and even just the title is really telling because it's not like, are we good at controlling our thoughts? Here's a paper about it. You know, the title of the paper is Measuring Thought Control Failure, Sensory Mechanisms of Individual Differences. It's, all right, how bad are we at this? And is there a difference between how bad we are at this? Um, kind of the money shot from the paper is really that we found that the average thought control index score was not significantly above zero. Um, I mean, I can, you know, the classic demonstration of that is try not to think of pink elephants, right? Like instantly your brain is just like, oh yeah, we're thinking about that because your brain just thinks things all the time and it never really stops. Um, and we, we, you can think of the brain kind of as running in two different processes, two different running processes. Um, in it's got, you know, exactly right. It's, Hey, what's happening? JavaScript sounds great. World of Warcraft sounds amazing. Let's do both of those things at the same time. That's not feasible. Um, but your brain is kind of running these two processes in parallel. And it's not like these aren't like areas of your brain, really. They're more different systems that involve different areas at the same time. Um, and one of them is the cognitive process and one of them is the affective process. And, uh, if you don't know Donald Norman, who's written a lot about this, uh, he, he, he is the one psychologist that every software, anybody even adjacent to software should know, because he's written a whole bunch of stuff about um, like he, he was one of the people that started the whole human centered design and universal design concept. So he's written a bunch about that, but he's written about this cognitive and affective thing in his book, emotional design and talks about how like the cognitive process is really kind of what you'd expect out of things. It's, you know, what, when you think brain activity, that's what you think. It's this logical linear thing. And then at the same time, there's this kind of affective process. Its job is to sit and sort experiences that you're having into good experiences and bad just to kind of take everything in your life and go that's good that's bad that's good that's bad and it i mean to to um pull on what um um your previous guest was saying about implicit bias like this is the portion of your brain that is learning about things and some of your biases that you've built up um, not even ones that are implicit. Some of your pretty explicit biases are based on your past experiences. And when your brain said, wow, we did that, that sucked. We're not doing that again, right? You, that's a bias. It's not bad. It's just how the brain works. But what Norman drives home is that if I apply what's called a negative affect to you, if I make you feel anxious, I make you feel upset or tired, you are actually worse at thinking. It affects your cognitive process as well. And the reverse is true. If I make you feel happier, I can actually make you better at thinking. And so that turns into like, if you've ever heard of dark patterns of UX, this is where those things come from, where kayak is going like, oh, if you've got 15 minutes left to buy this plane ticket, or, you know, when you add something to your cart and it's like, oh, it's three other people have it in their cart and there's only four left. You better have buy it. And they're like trying to make you stupid. They're trying to make you anxious to make you dumber so that you buy their crap. Why, why, why is it hard if I yeah. ask, like, uh, like, this seems to be a trend that, you know, we have used forever, like make people stressed and make them do bad, you know, things like this is how like phishing and all types of scams work. They just make you anxious. So you, I mean, why are we not learning to, you know, not be anxious? Or is it you know, so easy to trigger? Um, it's real easy to trigger. And it's, to some extent, there is a limit to how much we can control that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, <laughs> like, I don't either, frankly. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, cognitive biases in a bit and how those are distinct from what Mariam was talking about yesterday, or not yesterday, last episode, uh, as far as implicit bias. Some of these things are kind of hardwired in your brain. They're not things you can stop. They're not things you can learn to stop. Some of the stuff with implicit bias, you can, you can, you know, like he was talking about, you can explore different um, 
experiences. You can talk to different people. You can adjust your expectations and what you know about the world. Some of the stuff in the cognitive bias realm, you just can't stop. And your brain is pretty hardwired to do things like associate um, social status with survival. So I'm going to do what I do and derail for one second. Go for um, it. So because I hear this and I totally... I get it. I feel it, right? Like I'm, I'm like a professional at feeling anxious, um, and and yet, <clears throat> like this stuff that you're discussing, it works, right? Like, like these companies do it because it works, and because you know, Sam asked a good question, like, well, how do we prevent ourselves from that? Well, you don't, right? You already had the slide where we're chasing after our brain, like, stop it, stop it. Well, you can't stop it, <clears throat> and so, or right, we can train ourselves maybe with coping mechanisms and things like that, but we can't just stop it. Yeah. So are we going to like, I don't want to stop, <laughs> stop it. I don't want to um, interfere with like where you're going with a sort of kind of walking us through this content. But also, I'd love if and maybe you're going to get to this, and I'm just jumping ahead to talk a bit at some point this morning about since we can't stop it, how do we cope? How, because like, I think we'd all agree, like, this is bad. Don't take advantage mm. like these brands and these organizations and, and people like people inside the workplace. We all also learn, I think, to take advantage of the natural tendency of others to become anxious. Like I'm good at being anxious. I'm also good at making other people anxious. I don't like that about myself, but I know how to do it. Mm. And, I, and, and, and you get action that way. And so like, but I think we all agree that's bad, right? Like we agree. Uh, I hate to put it's value. It's not healthy. It's not. There you go. It's unhealthy. To be the recipient or the giver of that of those sort of scenarios. So how do we how do we handle that in in a workplace in our lives? Like if, if we're not gonna be able to stop people from creating it, then then how do you get out of a cycle of like negative stimuli that lead to negative thought patterns that lead to high anxiety or negative thinking capabilities and cognitive abilities? Like how do we break out of that cycle? Uh, when I find out, I'll let you know. No. Okay, uh, that's fair. Like that, hey, that would be great. Like. If you we, do find out and you let us know, could you actually go ahead and just just become a therapist? Like I know you say you're not like then like do that and like take on the world as your client. That would be awesome. I, I want I want him to invent a button that everyone just pushes and it's just right. Like if we're gonna if we're gonna go there, if we're gonna imagine, let's shoot for the moon, Jeff. Let's just get that button. Right. Well, well, imagine if there were a magic button where you where we could find a way to train other people to listen and respect each other. Right. So you could say so it would be acceptable to just say out loud. You know what? Like. The things you're doing right now and saying are making me uncomfortable and they're causing me like, well, imagine if you could say those words and that would be okay. And okay. that like, people would say, oh, I'm sorry. And they change their behavior. That'd be neat, wouldn't it? Now you are jumping ahead. Oh, oh good. <laughs> good. Oh, the easy. Yeah. This Sam has, wait, Sam, are you actually live on Twitch as well? Cause that's not from Coded Live. No, I know. I am. Yeah. <laughs> so you're I commenting from I over there, not from I our machines. Yeah. I have machines. <laughs> okay, good. Now we're going to get ahead. So wonderful. because We'll actually cool. touch on some of the earlier stuff too that you were talking about, about how to kind of start separating those two. So cool. But let's talk first about why we need to talk about it, because this sounds like it just sucks. But it is super important. It is really important to talk about these things, to talk about your mental state, to talk about your mental health at work regardless of if you have a diagnosis. And the big answer is because you're the only advocate for your own experience. You're the only person that can explain what it is inside of your own head and talk about what it is like to be you. Now, it isn't easy, but it's essential because there's nobody else that's gonna do it for you. And some of the fears that we have about it are overblown. Um, I've been trying to walk my own walk on this stuff or walk my own talk on this stuff for a while. And I found that really being open and vulnerable in a lot of cases creates cohesion. Now there is some degree of your mileage may vary with that because, um, I am a white male and in some cases, simply expressing an emotion that is not anger will get like golf claps from everybody around. I'm like, Oh, congratulations. You actually have a, more than two emotions. Um, but it's a, regardless being open and being vulnerable can help create cohesion, can help other people feel like they understand you more. And that can lead to better working conditions, literally at your job above and beyond that. There's simply the question of like, 
you have to understand this. If your emotional effect can affect your, you know, the affective process can affect your cognitive process. If you are having something that can affect your affective process, this is going to affect your work and pretending it doesn't and just sweeping it under the rug is literally pretending. Like, I mean, Sam mentioned it. I'm having, we have a cat that has just been basically diagnosed with um, um, cancer. And I mean, he's 15. It's been a long life, but I'm not, I'm not dealing with it well. Um, and yesterday I sat down and told my team, I'm like, literally, look, I'm dealing with this. Well, I'm, <laughs> this has happened and I'm not dealing with it. And as a result, I'm not going to be as smart for the next couple of weeks. I'm, you know, grappling with this. I'm going to be having other vet visits while we figure out what to do and how to keep him comfortable. And I'm not going to be as, I mean, I'm already can tell I'm more short tempered, um, more angry and frustrated. And that's normal. That's just processing emotions and having emotions and being human in the world. But it affects the team because it means that when a client, the client comes in around and says, oh, here's this thing. Is this a bug? And I, I, my response is to tell them to go to hell. And that's not good. That's not good for, you know, the professional relationship or, you know, my personal career. So letting my team know, look, you might have to be pinch hitting for me on these things because I'm just not going to be as capable of communicating as well, of thinking as well as being responsive in meetings. And putting that out in the open allows people to plan for it allows you to be ready for it and this can be like this can happen because of things like like the you know my cat it can happen because you're having problems with a family member it can have problems because you're dealing with something money related or it could be something because you're having problems with one of your mental illnesses of that day you know having problems with the way your brain is working and it's just not a good day it doesn't matter what it is that's driving the, you know, the, the root or the outcomes rather. It just matters that you are having these experiences. And as a result, your team needs to know so that you can adapt for it and account for it. Because if you're sitting there in a sprint planning meeting and you know that you're dealing with having to put one of your parents in a nursing home or dealing with a death in the family, and you're like, sure, I'll get the same number of points done to sprint, right? That you're lying to yourself and to the team. I mean, even leaving aside the part where sprints are, or points are mostly arbitrary and irrelevant in the first place. <laughs> but that's a different discussion. Point We're not is, having that discussion today. Different. Yeah. <laughs> Point is still that you're not going to be doing, you know, your top-notch work because you're preoccupied. Your brain is chewing on something else. And so just admitting that fact means that you can be more ready to plan for it, to know that you're not going to get as much done this sprint. And then on top of that, all of that, you need to replace the story in other people's heads because people look at your behavior and they make up a story for it. And let's talk about an example for that. So, um, couple jobs ago, I worked at a job where uh, I had a coworker whose name is Josh, who used to fall asleep at his desk. And it wasn't like cute like this. It was just like head back in his desk chair snoring. And we turned around and just, I mean, we made fun of the guy. Like, who does that? And nobody ever thought to ask him like, hey, are you having problems? Is something wrong? What's going on? And I never, I will never know. Um, I haven't even seen him since that. I've seen him once since that job. And, it, you know, we made up a story in our heads because this was around the time Diablo 3 came out. And we're like, oh, he's clearly just up late playing Diablo 3 and, you know, doing, watching dumb shows or whatever, and then just coming into work and not paying any attention. We had no idea. It could have been any number of things that were wrong that were wrong in his life, that were, he was having problems with, that he was struggling with. We could have been right also. I won't put that, you know, it's possible. But we could have been wrong. And none of us ever asked him. None of us ever clarified it. And this is actually a cognitive bias. So let's talk a minute about cognitive biases and how they did, well, they're both distinct from the implicit bias that Mariam talked about. And I like to talk about cognitive biases by talking about the walled garden and the dark forest. Um, this is a metaphor by the psychologist Gleb Sapersky uh, that I love because it really just drives home some of this stuff. And I'm realizing I cribbed all these from other um, presentations, so don't worry about the progress bar at the bottom. It's totally not accurate. I don't have that much content. <laughs> um, 
but the the you need to think of the part of your brain that you think of as you as the resident of this walled garden and it's really nice inside of this walled garden but it has really tall really thick walls that you can't get out of and it's there's so many things that your conscious mind can do but this is your intentional self is what Sapersky calls it this is the in Kahneman and Tversky they would call it system two this is the self that has evolved to you know be the cognitive thread in your life, to think of things, to envision a future, to talk to other humans and play with problems and be creative and all of these things. This is the intentional self. And outside of the walled garden is the dark forest. And the dark forest is just all of these things, all of the rest of the things that your brain does, all of these processes that evolved over millions of years to keep you alive and active and working with your, you know, as part of your, your community and your family. This is what Sapersky calls the autonomous self. This is the self that operates without you being in charge of it, without you in a lot of cases being aware of it, because that's a big key is that you can't see outside of the walls. You have no idea what's happening in the rest of that, in the, in the dark forest in general, you can only see inside of the walled garden. And the, you know, the autonomous self includes all of these processes that we think of in terms of like gut responses, in terms of um, autonomous responses. Like if you're, you know, if somebody throws a ball at you, the response is to catch it. And you do that without really thinking about it. The same thing is true with even just, you know, being a professional sports athlete, a professional sports athlete as opposed to a professional other athlete. But they, you know, it, the, the time frame for professional baseball to like, the this time it takes the ball to actually get from the mound to the plate is not enough for your muscles to respond. Like it's physically not enough for your muscles to respond. You have to actually start responding before the ball leaves the batter's glove. And they do that by learning what the pattern is and responding before the conscious mind even catches up. And what the relationship between these two is that the conscious mind can kind of throw messages over the wall and <laughs> can throw messages over the wall and something out there in the dark forest is throwing things back, right? <clears throat> we have no idea what threw the answer back and we have no idea why it arrived at the answer it did. All we can do is look at that answer. And by and large, we just take that answer and we'd run with it. Your brain throws something back and our conscious self, our intentional self looks at it and says, oh, that's something I believe, or that's something I think, right? We oh, I had a thought, right? We even phrase it like that. A thought happened to me. And we take that. And what's funny is in a lot of cases, those actually come with a sense of certainty. If you actually examine the concept of certainty, it is an emotion that happens to you. It has nothing to do with the quality of your actual thought, which is really kind of distressing when you get down to it, because you can be then very, very certain about something that is a very bad thought. So walled garden, dark forest, intentional self, et cetera, it's sometimes hard to envision all of that. So I like to think about the other parts of your, parts of your brain as a hyperactive border collie named noodles. This is one of the ways that I tend to anthropomorphize it. It just makes it easier to think about it. So cognitive biases in this case are things that are happening because noodles is giving you thoughts and you're just kind of taking them and not paying any attention to them. You're interacting with these thoughts and engaging with them and just doing things based on these thoughts without really examining or interact, uh, interrogating these thoughts. And in that way, these cognitive biases are a dance that you and noodles are doing together. It requires some degree of effort on your part to actually engage in these things. So like Mariam was talking about yesterday, part of noodles' job is to hold this model of your world, to maintain your expectations of what the world is like. And he builds that off of what's happened to you. So this is why expanding your horizons, expanding the places you've been and the people you talk to and the things you've experienced. That's why it affects your implicit biases because your implicit biases are based on noodles looking at what, you know, what we call common sense and just going, oh, that's the way the world works. Great. 
I will expect that that's the way the world works. And so when it, the cognitive bias I actually want to talk about is called the fundamental attribution error. And the fundamental attribution error is a cognitive bias that arises because noodles can't hold a whole person in his head. We're really complex. And so what happens is he turns around and just kind of makes an approximation. And so the fundamental attribution error is this cognitive bias that everybody experiences and literally every human where your like behaviors are as a result of things external to you. They're a result of your situation. So I'm dealing with things because of my cat, right? Other people are lazy, angry, or sloppy. And you catch yourself using those words where it's, you make an essentialist judgment about another human being, but everything that happens to you is for a reason. I'm speeding, I cut that guy off because I really need to make it to this exit and I'm late for this thing. That other dude's a jerk driver, right? So when you don't have the room to spread out your story, when you are unable to tell your story to other people, they're filling it in with these intrinsic attributes about you instead of understanding that it is something happening to you. What happens? <laughs> Maybe there's a little bit too. I don't know. Uh, what happens when the me in this drawing also decides to attribute those? Because I feel like that's the thing that happens to people too. It happens to me. Mm. I, I own cognitive biases. I'll, I know those things about myself. I try to be aware like, oh, I overslept because or whatever. But then I, but what happens when you start telling yourself that same story? Um, you know, like it's one thing for you to look at me and be like, oh, you're just lazy. What happens when you start telling yourself, man, I, um, God, is that, is that really the reason or am I just lazy? And then like you start telling yourself that own negative, like there's negative self-talk, right? Like, yeah. Um, I mean, my answer is hopefully therapy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it really is. I mean, so kind of to going back to the point you were talking about earlier about how do we catch these things? The answer is really starting to notice the difference between something you have thought about cognitively. Hey, Ed. Um, you know, something you've thought about cognitively and something that Noodles has just handed you. Being able to take those messages from Noodles and unpack them and go, where is this coming from? And most importantly, do I believe this thought? Do I want this feeling? And I mean, it's not like they're going to go away in those moments, but <clears throat> looking at it and examining it and interrogating it gives you a bit of emotional distance from it. So this is actually one of the things that I've gotten, probably the most beneficial thing I've gotten from meditation is this concept that my brain, noodles, is just going to think shit. Sorry going to think stuff and I, I can't stop it, but I don't have to buy into it. That my brain can have a thought and I can look at that thought and say, that is a stupid thought and I'm not going to engage with it anymore. Um, so my therapist um, <laughs> talks about instead of noodle, noodles can have positive and negative things, right? Like noodles yeah. is all over the place. Absolutely. Oh, no, um, don't get me wrong. Noodles is 100% useful you would not get along without noodles uh, right right sometimes you just want to be like good boy who's a good boy noodles but like sometimes noodles brings in the, the like the trash and so like um i don't think she made this up i think there's actually like a thing like these automatic negative thoughts so she refers to ants instead mm. of hyperactive collies right and so it's sort of like when you have that thought like literally picture them as ants crawling up here i'm like just flick them off like no, no. Yep. you will actually sometimes see me in a conversation like i, I like just like I will just flick my arm and like, that's exactly, it's like, get rid of them, go. Um, John Kabat-Zinn talks about it as popping soap bubbles, mm. which is the metaphor I tend to use. Um, it's just like, boop, like it's gone. Cause you don't want to grab it and like go, we don't like this and throw it out because Noodles doesn't understand. I mean, he is a dog. He doesn't understand the difference between like you positively engaging with a thing versus you negatively engaging with the thing. Mm -hmm. And if you spend a bunch of time and energy and mental thought on a negative thought, about how like, no, this isn't true. And this is, he's just gonna, you're just playing. He doesn't understand. And so what he does is he tends to bring you the things that you play with the most. One of the reasons I came up with the noodles concept in the first place is uh, my grandmother used to have a, well, my grandmother had a, a miniature schnauzer 
Um, it was a brilliant dog. Um, just, I mean, it was the kind of dog that was like scary smart where every time my grandmother left on like vacation, the dog and didn't take the dog, the dog would go into the bathroom and in the, from the bathroom trash, grab like one Kleenex, just one and shred it on the living room floor. Did not touch anything else in the house. Just the one that was just like, I know you left. You didn't take me. <laughs> um, but she would, she had a toy box. And when she was bored and I was sitting there and like reading or whatever, she would grab something from the toy box and come over and she had this like this woolly worm she loved and she would just like shake it and like, and, and uh, it was like, no, okay. But the noodles does the same thing. He'll go over to his toy box and he grabs the stuff that you tend to think about the most. This is one of the things that I learned when I was meditating is that like, I tend to think about where am I going next? What am I doing next? What do I have to be? Where's my next thing? And that comes from my noodles learn that because of my experience living as a person who's been diagnosed with ADHD in the world. Because I, if I don't pay attention to where do I need to be next? What am I doing next? What are the, then I miss things, I slip things and people get angry and upset and I get angry and upset at myself. And so this is a learned behavior that Noodles has, has learned to help me move through the world, but it really does not help my stress and anxiety levels. And so when I was meditating, it would be all of these thoughts about what are we doing next? And you would just sit down and calm Noodles and be like, no, Noodles, we're focusing on the breath right now. Come on. Noodles would go, okay. And like 30 seconds later, go over to the toy box and get the next favorite thing, just like my grandma's dog would do, and come back and like, we want to play with this. We play with this all the time. And you have to be able to build a distinction between those things and you have to be able to release them without engaging, which is, takes skill uh, and, you, and you have to build that. So that to answer your question in a roundabout way, hopefully you get a moment where you go, am I lazy? And then you look at that and you go, where's that coming from? Where is that thought coming from? Is that coming from a history of my parents or people in my life judging me based on how I live in the world? Or is that coming from reality? Because again, noodles is useful. And noodles can tell you a whole bunch of, like again, you couldn't get along without him. He does so much stuff for you. All of those autonomous processes do so much in the world. You cannot, like there's a whole, um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Less Wrong. It's an online internet community. And their whole gimmick is basically like, well, we just won't do any of the cognitive bias things. And it's like, that's not how this works. Like, you can't be 100% conscious and cognitive and logical all the time. You're not built for it. Your brain doesn't work that way. Noodles' job is to save you sugar, right? If you're in the world and like, it's literally, that's his job because your brain runs on sugar. Your whole body does. Noodles' job is to save you energy, to make it so you don't have to eat as much. He's literally like, it's a, a, if you want to go technical with it, it's like branch prediction in a in a processor, its job is to be something that is mostly right and saves you a ton of energy. But sometimes it's wrong and sometimes cat catastrophically so. So I want to ask you something else, because sure. I know you you feel strongly about this and I think the, the chat room is weighing in. So we all have issues and then it's, it's a matter of, you know, what do you call it maybe? And, uh, you know, you may or may not be too much of a fan of, you know, medical diagnosis, and maybe you're getting to getting to that. But, you know, um, I think Nicole said the other day, like, I, you feel upgraded sometimes when you can put a label on things, mm -hmm. but does that help? Or actually, is that, uh, you know, putting too many things into the same bucket as to what Noodles is asking you to do at, at a certain time? We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but some of it is, it's, um, if you're, working with that diagnosis, it is tempting. I mean, it, it turns into a case where you now have a label on yourself. Like it literally turns into that, oh, I am scatterbrained and disorganized and et cetera, because I have been diagnosed with ADHD. It is very tempting to, and very easy to fold that into your identity for that to become part of who you are. And there is a difference and a distinction between a tendency and an essential part of you. Because it's a question of how much energy does it take? I mean, it's almost like being an introvert extrovert. How much energy does it take you to interact with people? How much energy does it take me to do something methodically and slowly? And I don't want to say perfectly, but you know, 
um, in a way that my brain does not work. I can do it. It just takes me energy. It doesn't mean that I can't. It does mean that I'm really bad about my timesheets, which to the endless frustration of my coworkers. Um, and that's a thing that I just can't, I at some points that you have to live with it. Um, but I have to, I have to ask here then what is Frank? Cause I have no idea. It's uh all right. So it's one of the Star Trek, we'll call them aliens, um, it's guarded in Star Trek, the next generation. And just like, imagine like, you know, they're the most opportunistic, like they'll sell you anything and everything. If they find out that you're willing to pay for air, they're like, all right, well, I got a deal for you. It smells great. <laughs> they're a weird species. They got their, they got their due in DS9, I think. They'd been kind of underused before that. I'm a next generation girl. I named my son after Jean-Luc Picard. Oh, nice. It's because the next generation is like the definitive Star Trek experience. Uh, I mean, I agree with you, but I don't know if that's just because it's of our ages. <laughs> I don't know. I went back when we were, strangely enough, one night after a blues game while we were in Florida for the holidays with my family, like we were sitting around and it was the weirdest thing, like the hockey game ended and then Star Trek Next Generation reruns came on on the TV. And I was like, oh, nice. and uh my my 11 year old son was still awake he's like what's this i told him he's like oh i'm gonna watch this with you for a minute and he thought it was great so like you know must uh, have been past was, season four then <laughs> um may, maybe he seemed to enjoy i i thought it was great i, I think it's oh, no, still, it's, but it might be nostalgia i skip all the holodeck episodes every holodeck episode is, um, is, a, no, yeah. is a no for me hard no <laughs> only the ewoks this was the one with um like <clears throat> counselor troy like somehow um like has a baby and then the baby like grows at a ridiculous rate and he's like oh so, right yeah like i think the episode is just called like the child or something like that uh it was interesting i'd actually forgotten that episode now, now so i like to say i'm like the um the king of degree you'll notice i asked a question and now you've been on the same slide for like 10 minutes yeah. so see like i i can do that but Maybe Star Trek's a little too far off in the weeds. <laughs> I'll, I'll bring it back in. I'll well, we were doing, we were going a little heavy there. So we had to bring it up to lighten the experience. Um, but I mean, that's the, all of that is. Chris the, Mars, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, nice. Salt and Burnham. What's up, Chris? What's going on, man? It's important to talk about these things. But in a lot of cases, it we don't feel like we can um some of that's because there are you know legalish concerns or certainly hr related concerns about walking around being like yeah i've got here's my diagnosis and this is the thing like people don't feel comfortable talking about that especially if they're not diagnosed themselves or you know don't feel like they have any kind of lived experience about it and so i usually in my like if i'm giving a whole one hour talk about mental health i give um two versions of my story which we can do abbreviated versions of um, cause you don't want, like, it takes like 20 minutes and it's not very good. Uh, but the clinical version of my story starts with like, Art was born into a family with a history of mental illness, um, bipolar, depression, anxiety, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder. Uh, his initial symptoms manifested as acting out in this, uh, response to authority figures, um, including extremely impulsive behavior that occasionally harmed others. Uh, his, he developed a resistance to authority as a result of negative experiences in those contexts. Uh, he was eventually diagnosed with attention deficit disorder and clinical depression. Um, he experienced a number of different adverse effects, adverse experiences throughout his life, uh, including significant family tensions as a result of ingrained family patterns of behavior. Uh, he experienced a... Um, significant suppressive episodes, including ones during his middle school experience where he experienced a reaction formation against or in favor of self-isolation. Um, I mean, it goes on like that. It's talking in terms of the diagnoses and about the deficits. The experiential version of my story starts by me saying, you know, I always knew I was different from other kids. I could feel it. Like there was something that they could sense 
that they could see that I couldn't and that I didn't understand why I would do things that a thought would leap into my head and almost instantly I would be acting on it. And my parents or my teachers would ask me, why did you do that? And I would say, I don't know. And they didn't like that answer. And I mean, it goes on. And the point here that, that I want to drive home is that the, the differences in language is really the key. If you're talking in clinical language, you're talking about the diagnosis, you're talking about the deficits, you're talking about things and language that constrains and confines a human being. If you are talking experientially, you're focusing on what's happening to that individual and their inherent emotional experience and their personal truth of how it existed in the world. And I'm, what I'm trying to drive home is that we can talk about what's going on in our heads if we talk about it experientially because if we use thing if we use experiential language we can talk about you know things like having problem like my cat we could talk about that experience in the same breath and the same language as me talking about i'm having a day where i can't seem to focus on anything and i can't even understand the code i wrote yesterday because those become the same kind of language, even though one of those is related to my diagnosis and one of them is completely external. And so you can think about this almost in terms of accessibility, where this is a accommodation that can work for everybody, just like a curb cut, right? Like any good accommodation, people who don't have any problems with their own brain, <clears throat> I mean, as few and far between as those are, um, they can make use of the same language to describe their own experiences in the world and talk about them in the same way. And that helps erase the boundary between a diagnosis and not a diagnosis. And one, that will make your HR department happy. And two, it helps reduce the stigma around these things. Because even as a manager, it, it I mean, I've given this talk and, and um, I gave this talk at Build Stuff in Lithuania and a guy came up to me and was like, so I'm having a, you know, I want to talk with this one of my, my um, employees, and I think they're going through a depressive phase. How do I talk to them about it? And I'm like, well, for starters, you don't say that. Because that like, that's not how you talk about it. You talk about the experience that you're seeing them have. You talk about, hey, I'm noticing that these things are happening. Because it's, I mean, the differences between clinical and experiential language is really the difference between like this discussion and, you know, this discussion. And being, it's not just about the empathy involved, because clearly there's a difference there, but you can have empathy and talk about like, oh, how's your ADHD going? Like, I really care about it. And it's still awkward and not a good conversation to have, again, both from an HR perspective, but also from a sheerly personal perspective. It's easier to talk in experiential language. And it's better for everybody because clinical language sucks power out of people. It's based on passivity. These are things that are true about you, then they will always be true. Experiential language is about your experience. It's about how you live in the world. And that's a thing you can change. So, so I like this slide a lot. Um, I, I do wonder, so like it's one thing when you have the conversation, like you just had the two compare and contrast slides a second ago, where it's just like, I've noticed you're, you seem to be having trouble focusing on whatever, like, okay. But how do you how do you deal with the situation? Because this, I think, is hard for a lot of people. Like, it's great to say we should be talk, feel more confident and comfortable talking about the experiences we're having and finding ways to talk about mental health in that way or our own experience, mental health experiences with our teams and all that. But like, especially if you're dealing with something using, I hate to bring up now, you're because you're because you're going through this, and I don't want to like keep bringing up your cat that you're struggling with. But like, but it's the example of the hour, I guess. So like, so using that as an example, just because you're able to talk about it in those experiential terms, and just because it's some external locus of control as opposed to internal, you still have a situation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> external oh. versus internal locus of control. <laughs> right. You still have an external like like this. The fact remains that because of your own. Um, your own mental states and the way you deal with those those external uh, stimuli, 
you're still um, different people will respond to them differently. So you can say, well, I'm going through this and there are gonna be people who are still not gonna have empathy. There's still gonna be people oh, sure. who are like, all right, well, geez, I'm sorry your cat's sick, but like, we got a job here, man. Like, so so there's still, which which sucks, but like that, but people are like that. And um, so not to, we got 11 minutes now. This is, like every hour I think, oh, we're gonna go long. Um, <laughs> I, I would love to, even if it's just a few minutes and if, and if there's not time, that's fine. But like, how do we help teach others who maybe aren't the ones who are struggling in the moment to like, and maybe this is a whole different episode about probably about empathy and emotional intelligence and that sort of thing. Like I'd mm -hmm. love to have that episode too, but you know, how do we teach people to, to respond and understand and, and hear you? Like asking the question is great, but then to actually hear you, because I think there's a lot of people, myself included, I've gone through a journey over the last, um, now I'll get personal for a second. I've gone through a journey over the last few years. I've, well, I've gone through a journey for the last 40 plus. Um, and it took me, you know, decades longer than it should have to do anything about taking care of myself. Um, and now I am. And part of that experience for me is actually being willing to talk a little bit about it myself with, with people who I work with, people who I care about. But there's always this fear in the back of my mind of uh, there's still lashback. It could still be career limiting. Like being willing to talk about me open is great, but there may still be others, your leadership and managers or your colleagues who are like, that's really nice that, that Art's willing to talk about these things. And now I understand him better. But as a result, I'm not going to depend on him next time. Like there's still that risk of like, that's great that we're having an open conversation, but it could still get in your in your professional way. It's right? funny because actually in the full version of this talk, there's a whole section where I'm like, okay, Throughout the course of this talk, your brain has been making up a bunch of excuses about why you're still not going to talk about this. So let's dig into it. And that's actually one of them. Um, I mean, it's real. That's a real thing. It, it is. But it's also, well, one, the hell with those people, um, for starters, like just to get that out there. But it, it's also you putting these things out there and you being able, being able to explain the effect that it actually has on you helps. Um, it also helps to normalize it. Um, mm -hmm. I, especially if you're a person in a position of power that can help, um, to talk about these things and to expect your team to talk about them, not forcing them to, but to make it a normal part of the processes to talk about in retrospectives, how everybody feels about a thing, how you feel about the, I mean, that's kind of when you do, if, um, done like the the fist of five or whatever in the um at the end of a, a planning session where it's like hey what's your confidence in this kind of thing that's basically a you know management um management consultanted up way to say how comfortable are you about this how do you feel about this planning session um breaking it down to feelings and explaining about those things is um important but i also want to say that i have I have encountered very, very few people who respond that way. I have encountered some people who want in it, they want to help. And in return, they do the thing you're describing where it's, oh, well, I'm just not going to stress art out. So I'm not going to give that to him. And the, my response to that is, is to help you. It becomes a form of managing upward in a way to understand. And, and it, it, it's realistic because they don't know what's in your head and you're not, they don't know what's going to stress you out versus what's not. So you have to be there to tell them, this is my danger zone. This is not, this is a thing that like, I have, a, um, I've had some pretty bad experiences on ETL projects at this point, like the extract transform lift pro like oh, all very on ETL are bad experiences. Dude. <laughs> well, yeah, but these were better worse than most. Um, and now at this point, like I can't, I almost can't be on those projects because it I just start off in the hole kind of mentally and being able to explain to somebody like, look, I can pinch it on these projects. You don't want me in a position of authority. You don't want me in a position of um, being a big decision maker or somebody that you're relying on to be critical in those roles. I can do it on other projects. I can't do it on these. Painting that, you know, being able to paint this, this area and say, this is a thing that I can do. These are things that I cannot do. These are things I can do, but it takes me energy. And one, you have to identify those yourself. And then two, you have to figure out how to communicate those to others. But framing it that way and going, look, these are the things that are okay. These are the things that cause me stress and anxiety. They're going to 
if they're a good manager, they will want that because they want to understand what you can be counted on to do and what things that you would be happy to do. So, I mean, in, right, it does come down to the fact that it's still a capitalist society and we do have to do actual work that's not just always fun. But we, you know, there are things again that it's like, I can do this, it will take me energy. I can do these things, I love it. And I can't do these things because it just goes south. Or I can do these things if you really need me to, but I need some recuperation time afterward. All I can think of right now is um, chess pieces, right? Like we mm. all use chess to win chess, right? But we understand that the bishop only goes diagonal. We don't hate that the bishop only goes diagonal. We just understand that that is its strength, right? And that's what it can do. And so in a way, how I'm hearing this is that like you can raise your hand and say, you know, I'm a bishop. You know, I'm, I'm never going to be a rook. You know, I'm not going to do that. But my true strength lies like this. And people could be like, you know what? I'm taking that bishop every time I take out the king, man. You know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm down envisioning somebody like screaming at a bishop. Like, ah, why don't you go sideways? I I'm going to do that next time I play chess. I'm going to yell at my pieces. <laughs> when I, like when I need the knight, like, man, can't you just take this thing next to you? I'm going to, oh, yeah. Why won't you be a queen? All I need is a queen. But it's also like, in some degree, metaphor, is, cool. so, yeah. Right. Um, but to extend on that, like in some cases, the bishop can go sideways, like in a human sense, not in chess, but unless you're playing a weird chess. Right? Okay. Okay. So I'm destroying your metaphor. Let's. Um, <laughs> but you know, human beings can stretch, can grow, and that's important too. Is to not try and get locked or to lock other people into you will never do this. There are some things that I'm unable to do without great effort. My timesheets. Um, and so it is simpler to rely on reminders than it is for me to try and construct a, a, a massive reminder structure that I will eventually acclimate to and ignore um, to get my timesheets done. On the other hand, there are things that, I mean, even over the past year, I've grown and changed and can do things that I couldn't do before that used to cause me a lot of stress before that I'm getting better at now. Human beings grow and they change and we need to accommodate that um, and, or at least be understanding of that and not, it goes back to the fundamental attribution error, right? It's real easy to just go, oh, art, ADHD. There's the label, art moves in these ways. That's the way this piece works and never update that and never expect it to change. So here's my bad question, and maybe it's opening a can of worms. I, I, I get the language, experiential versus you know clinical, but do you see you know benefits of some of those labels? And and this is like I said, it's a bad question. Like when it comes to especially in the United States, uh, you know, insurance and getting the support um, that you might be needing. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, we're engineers, right? So it makes sense for us to kind of look at it and go, or, or at least we're engineering adjacent and we look at it and go, okay, well, isn't this technically correct? Um, so let's talk about that a second. And a diagnosis is coming out of right now, um, the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Behavioral Health Edition 5. It's the big book of ways that your brain breaks. And it's important if you've not read this thing, because it's, boy, it's a page turner. Um, you have to understand that everything in here is basically just a checklist. Like when you are getting diagnosed with something, it isn't a blood test, it isn't a brain scan, it is somebody listening to your experiences in the world and then making little ticks and going, well, you have seven of nine of these, congratulations, here's your diagnosis. So they're buckets that we're sorting things into. And I'm not begrudging anyone the buckets. We need to wrap our arms around this some way. We need to figure out how to affect these things some way but we run the risk of letting those things define us when they don't necessarily because for starters um my experience as someone with adhd is actually very different from other people's experiences with adhd and that can i mean it's the same diagnosis and some of the things are similar but the way that my brain expresses those things the way that it is for me to experience those things is different from other folks um, 
There are things that I have adopted as coping mechanisms that other people can't seem to make work for them. There are things that they were that had adopted that don't work for me. And the same thing is true of m almost all of these things. Like it, 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 to your point, a lot of the times, if you are going to engage in a medical context, you need the diagnosis so that insurance covers it. If there was a way for them to do a blood test or a brain scan to verify your diagnosis, your insurance would absolutely make you do it. But they don't because there isn't such a thing. Yeah, I mean, like to me, the like the danger of labels. <laughs> Another whole episode. Are we all writing these down? Let's like all the all the episodes we're going to come up with and find people to talk about <laughs> the, the danger, although so much of this entire show is about the danger of labels really across every episode but like the danger of labels in in the mental health context i think is you know you have talked a lot about like um and i and by the way this is another thing i have actually struggled with my whole life it's like all right well now i'm this like you've defined your narrative and like and that's true but also it kind of comes back to the cognitive biases you were talking about before and the implicit biases we talked about last week with marianne like it's not just that you've decided to apply that label. And like what I think I hear you saying, and I think it's totally true, is this now everyone else applies that label to you too. And everyone else, like every one of the four of us on this call, we have our own lived experiences and our own uh, cognitive biases around what it is to for someone to be ADHD or to have OCD or struggle with bipolar disorder or other things. And so we have it in our own minds of like, oh, not only is it the checkboxes, this person's bipolar, got it. But now the way you handle someone with bipolar disorders, you do this. And so we also apply like unilateral treatment or interaction with somebody who we believe has that thing. And once we do that, we're not doing anyone any good, not you, not me. Um, and it's, yeah. It, yes. Yeah. I mean, and that's stigma, right? Like that's literally mm -hmm. the number of people who believe in mental health has been increasing. Like it's a lot rarer than it used to be to find somebody who says, yeah, I don't believe in diagnoses or any of that crap that comes back but, to what overland gamer said before too right it is getting better well but the it's what's slow. happening is is uh, concurrent with that stigma is actually increasing hmm. because we're talking about it in these essentialist terms we're talking about it in terms of oh here's your diagnosis now i know i can't rely on you to do this I can, you can be expected to do that it's you know this is the way that i treat you um that stigma is increasing because we have now believed it, that it is um, um, you know, internalized it and, and used it to affect others. I mean, I agree with you that um, with Rocketman that it is about quantifying the analog, but I mean, for starters, there's also qualitative information, which is qualitative data is real. Uh, we can measure things qualitatively, qualitatively. Uh, and we as engineers have a definite bias toward quantitative, but that's a wholly different episode. Um, point is that it is, I, they can have it. This I'm not saying that we should get rid of this system. I'm saying that we shouldn't talk about it with ourselves in this system because it becomes too easy to let the model become reality. And if we talk about it experientially and said, instead, um, well, I think you oversimplified, but it, I think it's natural too, if that makes sense. I think it is, that is the way that a lot of people think about this. So I appreciate the chance to call it out that we can talk about these things experientially and all these buckets don't matter as much. And it's not that you don't get sorted into the bucket and it's not that you're not getting treatment, you know, related to the bucket, et cetera. It's just that, you can talk about what it is like to be you and not have it affect um, people, not have an easy label for people to slap onto you at that point. Yeah. Uh, as with, you know, every episode we can, you know, talk hours and hours more. Uh, oh God, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Big Bang Theory references. Yeah, we we all we were all humans. That's why we have the human show. We all you know work with people across uh, you know, across a variety of spectrums of life and all of our issues. That's what makes it real. Um, so, Art, uh, any any way you want to you know wrap up this conversation, or is this a good you know screen to yeah end I mean, the conversation uh, on? I guess the last thing I want to say is that. 
if you have you know, whatever struggles you're dealing with in your head, you are not broken. And yeah. you're still a human being and you still deserve to be treated with respect like any human being. And you are still worthy of love and attention and the accolades that you deserve. That's, I try to throw that in where I can because it's a thing we don't often hear about. Um, so I really appreciate you having me on. Uh, I'm super stoked to be you know, your first outside guest. Absolutely. We love you. We love your art for everything that you do. Uh, so we'll be back in January. So uh, this is us, you know, piecing out. So in the meantime, everybody have a happy end of year. Uh, happy eat all the food that you can eat. I want everyone to, to have a cookie. Take care. Yeah. And um, we will see you next year. And, you know, happy holidays. Uh, happy whatever you're celebrating. Be well. Be productive. Take care of your loved ones. Be appreciated. And, you know, appreciate other people. Yeah, just take care. Bye. All right.